Dante Hicks is a guy you probably knew back in high school. A nerd at heart, but he could be anyone's friend, really. Whatever happened to that guy? Did he ever go to college, or is he still working at that same old, barely functioning convenience store? Did he end up dumping Caitlyn for cheating on him, or is he still playing hockey? Now what if this guy that you probably lost touch with became the main character in a movie? Well lucky for you, that movie exists. We watched it again almost 30 years after it came out, and for the first time as a 27 year old man, it made me cry. <laughs> this is Clerks! <laughs> that movie, wait, it made you cry? Yeah, so, watched it last week, uh, okay. for the fr only the second time. Yeah, I forget that was only your second time watching. So this is similar to Carrie, right? Like, uh, I didn't grow up with this movie, uh, you showed it to me. And I watched it for the first time four years ago with you, and you were wanting to do this as a podcast, and I was like, all right, I'll watch it for a second time. Kind of nervous because I'm not like, I feel like the fans of Clerks and Kevin Smith's are like hardcore. The View SQ universe. Yeah, like yeah. Kevin Smith fans are like diehards. Yeah. By the way, guys, before we get too deep into this conversation, we are going to be replacing our usual Patreon after show with a monthly mailbag Q&A bonus episode. And it's going to be for those in the way too nice dude tearing up. So if you want to leave us a question, we'll answer it by the end of November. We'd love if you hopped on. I think that final like Randall, like angry monologue that he has against Dante really got to me. It really hits. And I don't think it was like a tearjerker moment, but it was a... I think it just was like a sense memory thing where it brought me back to that time when I was 21. Yeah, it activates something in you, you know, because you connect very fundamentally with either Dante or Randall. Like, well, like I think everyone's been a Dante or a Randall at one point. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those, like, you know, uh, you either die a Dante or you live long enough to see yourself become the Randall. <laughs> Did you like that? Oh, God. It's like that <laughs> fucking quote and just like... Growing up, you realize Joker's the hero. <laughs> like, fuck <Joker>. that. <laughs> but, um, okay, cool. That's really cool to hear because I grew up with Clerks since high school. A uh, perfect time period to start watching Clerks. You know, it's like, uh -huh. it's a great high schooler movie. I think people say this commonly about Clerks, but it's really funny when you're young when you first watch it. You just watch it as a comedy. You know, oh, dick jokes and whatever. Yeah, and you relate to it as you get older. And then when you get older, it has much more of an existential thread. And um, that's what I love about this movie. And it's also like... But isn't that the best part about movies that you grew up with? Is when you get older, you watch it through a different lens? Yeah. yeah. I consider Toy Story that way. Sure, yeah. Like the Toy Story, at least the main trilogy. Like when you watch it as an adult, the certain themes like hit different. You know, because that movie... Uh, those movies are clearly a metaphor for parenthood, you know? Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, that's those are my favorite movies that, like, stand the test of time because as you you get older, the movie gets older with you. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And Clerks has a weird way of doing that because it has such juvenile humor, obviously. Right. You know, it's very... And which is what was kind of fresh about it at the time in a weird way. It was originally rated NC-17 when it was coming out. I mean, you know? yeah, it's pretty out there. And it's funny because they, they don't show any nudity. There's no violence or anything. It's just the crass conversations these characters have. Yeah, the language <laughs> is very crass. But there's also, like, scenes that are you don't see happen, at mm -hmm. least with Caitlyn and the guy in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's some... Where you're like, that's still gnarly. It's pretty vile, yeah. But, but it has such a, a deep, like, heart to it. You know, it has such a clear pulse. And the story is still so focused. Like, there's so many, like I said, there's so many... Obviously, random dick jokes and weird people putting eggs in their mouths and stuff like that. But through it all, there's this ongoing, very focused storyline about a guy who's unhappy with his place in life, but has no strength or understanding of how to change it. I think what's really special about it is that guy, Dante, as I said in my synopsis, is uh, we've seen hundreds of those guys through time, right? Yeah. Whether it's people we hear about through our friends or we've... Ex been friends with those type of guys and usually those guys don't get to have their own movie you know yeah <laughs> and that's i think what's really special about clerks is that it makes guys like dante and randall the heroes of the story mm -hmm. and we we watch it now and you're just like man these guys would work at my next door convenience store that i would walk to to get like some snacks you yeah know? That you wouldn't bat an eye towards you but know? <laughs> these guys have their own lives their own troubles or own discussions and qualms and their own views on life and um that's kind of what i love about it yeah yeah and um sorry i totally just drew a blank no go ahead. 
<laughs> we have all the time in the world. Yeah. You uh, were waiting at least 40 minutes for a f food that was 10 minutes away. Oh, leading up to this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're like fully zopped out. Yeah. So for yeah, <laughs> listeners, do you mind if I tell the story? Do you mind yeah. if I take this one? Yeah, go ahead. We were setting up and probably like a good 20 minutes before we, we were supposed to start recording this. I was like, you know what? I'm going to place a Postmates order. Just, you know, so I can get eat something right before this. Well, to be fair, not even 20 minutes, an hour before. Oh, you're, you're right, you're right. Sorry, sorry. It was, like, way earlier. You're not I, irresponsible that way. An hour before, you were like, I want to order some food. Yeah. yeah. You're, really what I meant is I anticipated it getting here 20 minutes before we were supposed to shoot. Right. That was my bad. But, yeah. Long story short, the delivery got horribly delayed. And 30 I'm minutes. Here, like, and even the process of canceling it took forever. And so... I just now ate finally after going to DoorDash instead. <laughs> and to, I want to like, not to put you on the spot, but like you ordered like McDonald's and you like, like just shoveled it inside your mouth. Like before we started shooting. Yeah. I just had, I needed something fast. And then I was like, all right, man, do you need a second? And you're like, nah, man, I'm fully rejuvenated. Let's fucking turn this camera on. <laughs> <laughs> well, McDonald's is the fastest to deliver. Anyone who, you know, who uses Postmates knows that usually those fast food joints are super quick. And when you order McDonald's, it just comes right to your door. So what you got to do next is use our code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they make the sponsored us. But yeah, I can't eat before like a record. Yeah, yeah. But at least like I got to eat at least three hours before recording. Because even if it's like an hour before, I get bloated and I'm like... You get zonked out pretty easily from food. You, you do the opposite thing where like you get really hyper and like aggressive when you don't eat. I'm very out of it and bloated when I, when I don't eat. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, usually eating, it like, energizes me. And it's so funny. I feel like uh, going into a shoot, I'm stressed out, and I'm kind of not, like, a great person to be around going into a shoot. Like, at least 10 minutes before, I'm always, like, pissed off, almost. <laughs> and then afterwards, it's like, let's go, man. What do you want to do next? Yeah, and you're we just, like, just did that. And you're like, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, that took everything out of me. But, but yeah, we get to watch movies for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Who are we? <laughs> but um, what was your experience watching it as a twenty-eight year old? I mean, I've seen this movie so many times. Like I, know. I and so but I always love this movie. Do you have a different perspective on it now that you are also doing what you love and are kind of outside of the well, service industry? Yeah, well, you've been out of the service industry for like over a year. You know? Yeah, I've had some space. Yeah, and but um, for you, it's been quite less than a year. You yeah, know? and so. Yeah, for sure. I think there's always something that I'm going to... It's always going to hold a special place in my heart. And I'm sure anyone who's worked in the service industry can connect to this movie. I think everyone should watch this movie who's worked in customer service. Customer service in general, yeah. yeah. Like, my first job that I've had, I was 19. Um, I worked at a Cold Stone. Arena. You were a showman at heart. I was a showman at heart. You know, I scooped ice cream, I sang those tip songs, I did the whole deal. And you just wanted to make people laugh. That was your thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You that's... were like, ice cream is a secondary. Let's just entertain people. <laughs> but that's such an inside joke, by the way. Just to you keep you throw out inside jokes sometimes, like <laughs> listeners don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm not gonna explain it. <laughs> I know, but a listener would just think you just said that authentically. <laughs> like, and they're gonna be like, that was kind of cringe. Well, okay. <laughs> I should now I should, I feel like. But so if you watch any interview with like like actors in like a comedy show or a movie like the interview will always end up just being like the guy the host being like well was there improv on set you know yeah yeah it's my least favorite question because it's like the least interesting thing to me but the actress will be like well you know like when you know when michael's on set i'm just trying to make michael laugh and then you know we get going and then the director's called cut and then you know it's like they're so into the fact that they were just having fun on set and yeah, so it's just overused. It's like, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with answering with that, but it's just overused by so many people that I think you just became so desensitized to it well, that it's... now you use it on me in front of people. <laughs> yeah, Chris and I, you know, at the end of the day, we just try to make each other laugh. Yeah, so just to clarify for any <laughs> listeners. because he... <laughs> It's very inside baseball. Anyways, Cold Stone, first shot. Yeah. So at 19, that was your first job. Yeah, that was my first job. You know, well, I mean, my first like official job. I've done like under the table work before that. You know, yeah, as course. a teenager and stuff. But um, that was my parents, first. parents, yeah, exactly. I was very much both a Dante and a Randall at the same time. Basically, where I worked there for way too long, I complained about it all the time. I grew to resent everything about it, but didn't do anything to change it. You know, 
And then also at the same time though, I had a little bit of those Randall tendencies because I worked there for so long that I just didn't give a fuck about what I said to customers because I'm like, well, what are they going to do? Who cares? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I remember you used to tell me stories of what you just said to that customer. This is when I first met you, too. Yeah, and it's not the type of person I am now, but at the time I was much more You were more younger, snark- though. Yeah. I was much more snarky as a customer service person. But yeah, yeah, it is funny. Now you, I feel like a lot of times when you talk to me about those times at Cold Stone, you talk about it with like a certain sense of shame. You're like, God, I was such a like a early twenties asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> like who the fuck was I? But but you know, I think this movie taps into something very real that young people never want to settle down or be complicit with their place. Like Randall is. That's what's interesting about it. He's super happy with what he has, right? Right. Dante is so eager to do something else, but still doesn't at the same time. Totally. I, we'll get to that. I think yeah. that those those are themes that like are pretty deep that we can go into. I think like I want to start big picture a little bit. So my my first job, going off of what you said, uh, was at my dad's deli, which he doesn't run anymore. But like uh, when I was in like ninth grade. Like, my dad was ran a deli, and I just kind of helped him out a little bit in the kitchen, or, like, took orders from customers, and kind of was, it was my first real life experience in dealing with customers, and all kinds of customers. So, the deli, the way it was set up, it was, like, half deli and half grocery store, and because I was younger, my dad, like, put me in charge of the cash register for the grocery store. Okay. So, like, very similar position to where Dante is at the store, just, like, dealing with all sorts of customers, asking weird questions, and all that kind of stuff, but I was, like, an eighth grader. Um, which is charming in his own right. Customers love little kids helping out, you know what I mean? So they're yeah. like, oh, look at that guy. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but you see all sorts of people, and then I worked at a Wendy's when I was in uh, college, and then I uh, worked at a Raising Cane's, and then I you worked... You worked at a Raising Cane's? I didn't know that. You never like, told me about that. Yeah, for like a year during my junior year of college. You worked at Raising Cane's for a year, and you never told me about that? Did I never tell you? You never told me about that. I did, yeah. Like, they opened a Raising Cane's nearby, and you never mentioned it once. Yeah, this was back when I was in uh, University of Tennessee. Like, I worked at the Raising Cane's on that campus. Something that I like this movie attacks is, like, the people around the store that you work at can also become friends. Because like the you end community up, you're in. You cross paths with each other, not only with your coworkers, but like the next door store or the next door restaurant because you trade food with them sometimes. Oh yeah. yeah. And there's also something very special about the bond you have with your coworkers too, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, because you're in the trenches with them. You know? You're in the trenches with them and sometimes you'll have a slower day than others and you're just kind of surviving, shooting the shit, doing things, you know, when you're bored. Yeah. And like, I also like how it tackles the feeling of like, when you're standing at the register talking about nonsense, whatever, just bullshitting about movies and stuff, a customer coming in does feel like you're being interrupted, even though that's really your job. <laughs> when yeah, a customer the, way, comes in. the way Dante will like be like, all right, geez, okay, here you go. Anyway, yeah. so what were you saying? Like, it's <laughs> yeah. always like a fuck you. Come on. Yeah, man. yeah, exactly. Get that, out of here. We it, were actually having fun for a second. It's very real, yeah. But yeah, so um, do you want to start off with the character of Dante? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. So we first meet Dante when he rolls out of his closet. <laughs> yeah, it's a great introduction. I forgot about that. It's so efficient, too. Just, like, we get right into the story. There's no messing around. Uh, we immediately understand, like, who this guy is. Which, like, just from his shitty room. Like, the idea yeah. of, like, picking out clothes from a pile is, like, so real. I know, dude. <laughs> Especially, yeah, I know, uh... I know the feeling of like, when, especially when you have like a work uniform, because they don't have uniforms in that movie. But when you have a uniform, you'll just fucking pick it up off the floor because you just wore it last night and you're like, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> just the shoes and everything. And uh, uh, I, I love the immediate like, fu- the, the shittiness of the place he works at, where the, mm-hmm. the lock has the gum stuck into it. So he has to put this sign out with yeah, shoe polish. I assure you we're open. <laughs> There, it's very efficient storytelling. Yeah, and you also kind of feel for him immediately, like because he's being called in on his day off. That's such a common experience anyone who's worked in the service industry yeah, yeah, yeah. knows. We've all done that. We've all covered shifts with the promise of like getting something in return or just being like, all right, I, I got your back, no worries. But and even, then end up regretting it and then like hating yourself for it. <laughs> yeah, well, even the feeling of like knowing 
like they say it later in the movie like you hold the weight of the world in your shoulders like yeah, this place would fall apart that opening kind of taps into that because he could have easily said no but I, at least in my experience I know the feeling of like well if I don't do it no one's gonna do it they're screwed and I'm gonna screw over my coworkers. like I'm responsible for them because I'm the only one that could do this thing yeah and it's good to like you know it is a team sport and you should like you should have each other's backs I, th I believe so yeah. but it is something I had to learn is uh Understanding that, hey, listen, it's what Randall says at the end, you know, understanding that job doesn't mean that much. And if you need to take care of yourself or if you got simple things like if it's your day off and you feel like you want to spend your day off as your day off, then do that. Yeah. Um, but it's like when you, it's like high school, right? Where everyone that's not in high school anymore always tells the high schoolers, like, hey, man, trust me, like, at the end of the day, high school doesn't really matter. It's just, like, don't take it that easy. Have fun. But yeah. when you're inside high school, that's your entire world. Yeah. So you can never be like, oh, well, this doesn't matter. You're like, no, this is a prison. I'm stuck in it, and it's my life. Totally. But that's how it feels sometimes when you're in a young age, like, in your early 20s, or, hell, in your 30s or 40s, and you're working this kind of job where you feel like this is the most important thing I could be doing right now because this is my entire life. Well, and the difference is, yeah, he goes in anyway when he doesn't want to and complains about it the entire movie. And I think that's the critical difference. If he went in and was like, you know what, I agree to this, it sucks, but whatever. I'm not he, even supposed to be here today. Then that became the thing, right? I'm not even supposed to be here today. But it's like, you didn't have to go in, you know? Tiny details like him stealing the newspapers. Yeah, yeah. Which is also so, <laughs> which is so great. Like, him setting up the store and opening it up. Like, I remember helping my dad opened up like the deli and grocery store mm -hmm. and those like tiny details like that are so great opening shifts man you know i had opening to open shifts. up christmas morning once it, oh my god I, rem I remember your instagram story i'll just be <laughs> like merry christmas oh like, it was yeah that was an actual post it was yeah it was probably like 2017 or something yeah, like that yeah, yeah. it was me just unraveling all the saran wrap covering all of the candy at Coldstone, and I literally just yell out, I love opening on Christmas morning! It's my favorite! Merry Christmas! Like, I full-on get into, like, <laughs> a psychotic... And I was by myself in it, but... And then people were commenting, like, you're the real hero of the holidays. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, it was nice. I'm not gonna act like I didn't appreciate it, but the first, like, real customer scene you get is this fucking dude standing around at the front with his coffee, and then when someone comes in to buy cigarettes, he's like, hey, how long you been smoking for? <laughs> oh... Okay, what, th th just the fact that he takes out this lung. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? <laughs> yeah, okay, so, you know, the customers. A lot of times you're watching, like, okay, are these just, like, are we seeing a lot of these customers just because, like, they're, like, funny non sequiturs? Mm -hmm. Like, the egg guy, the Chulis gum representative. Every non sequitur with the customer is paying it back to the theme of the movie. Yeah. And I kind of wrote down some of them. If you want to go through some of them. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. The Pringles. Is, yeah. That, that scene really stood out to me this time. Where he's like, <laughs> it just cuts to Dante trying to help this guy take the Pringles can. <laughs> his arm got stuck. And it's just a funny cut. At first, it's just this wide. He's like, all right, come on, just pull. Mm -hmm. And then he says, a little word of advice. Sometimes you got to let those hard to read chips go. Which is a great, like, you know, life lesson line. Immediately right afterwards, he complains about his ex who cheated on him all the time. Well, that exactly. That, him obsessing, I guess you can call it, with uh, Caitlin Bree is kind of that really good thread that constantly is put in throughout all of the non sequiturs that makes it work. That it still makes the story feel very focused because when they're... Um, you know, right right after he calls to verify that Caitlyn was getting married, how Randall comes in and um, Dante's like, can you believe it? She's really getting married. And he's like, you know what never sat right with me? You ever see Return of the Jedi? You know, like, they still talk about bullshit, but it, there's still that constant, like, looming main focus of the story. Yeah, 100%. It's a thread that, like, weaves in and out in unexpected ways. Yeah. So, the, uh, speaking of the Return of the Jedi stuff is... So another one I wrote, a non sequitur, is the Star Wars Independent Contractors. Yes. Which, before we get into how I think this relates to the theme of the movie, because it does seem like this funny Tarantino non sequitur, there's something that I love about this, is that if you look at this scene, this is kind of the birth of the movie podcast. Because, <laughs> you know, I will say, because Tarantino in his movies, right, he was known for, like, characters talking about, like, 60s TV shows. Yeah. Like, Reservoir Dogs and stuff like that, and ways where it started, talking about movie characters in a certain way that 
uh, like actual like gangsters and uh, like crime people didn't talk about in movies mm -hmm. before, right? And I feel like what Kevin Smith did is what like he did that same thing to actual like Star Wars nerddom mm -hmm. that I feel like wasn't done before. We didn't see like movie characters talk about Star Wars in that way. It was always very broad of like Star Wars so cool. But the fact that like Randall and Dante are getting into like Return of Jedi, these independent contractors could have been like victims in this explosion. Yeah. Because Casualties of war they had nothing to do with. Because an empire, obviously they all worked for the Imperial yeah. Army and you know, they were all bad, but they had to get a lot more people because it was a bigger Death Star. Yeah. But that's how people nowadays talk about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it ages weirdly well, doesn't it? <laughs> because we've all seen Star Wars, it, like, it shows that these are characters that have seen Star Wars a hundred times, mm -hmm. and they have now gotten to a point where they think about shit like this. Well, and do you know that there was an alternate ending originally when they made it? No. This is related because they, they planted it in that scene, supposedly. In the original ending, you know, and we'll talk more in detail about it later, after the whole year closed line happens, someone comes in to rob the store and he shoots Dante in the head. Jesus. Like straight up Dante dies originally in the alternate ending. And they actually shot it and everything too. But then they just cut it out right. in the edit and it just ends where it ends where you see it. But people were saying it was supposed to pay off that line where he says, that's all life is, is a series of down endings kind of thing. Oh, wow. Which is interesting, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, that would have been a weird call for an editor. Yeah, and Kevin Smith himself kind of makes fun of it, where he's like, yeah, that's before I knew how to end a movie. <laughs> he's like, yeah, no, I'm glad that didn't happen. But but don't you agree, though? You look at it, you're like, oh, yeah, this is how, like, everyone on Twitter talks about Star Wars oh, yeah. or, like, the MCU or stuff like that. And it, it feels like now we take it for granted, but, like, if you want to look at it in the eyes of, like, this movie came out in 1994, I don't think characters in movies talked about nerd stuff like Star Wars before then. And he was also, like, very aware of... Because Kevin Smith was a comic book nerd, he was one of the early people to do the View Skew universe and do, like, this related universe yeah. before the MCU. And yeah, everything. oh, yeah, before... Yeah, decades before all that was popular. And now when that stuff is done, it's like, oh, we're all copying from the MCU. But Kevin Smith was such a pure comic book nerd that he knew that. Yeah, that's just naturally what his language was when he made movies. <laughs> and that's why I think fans of his really love him, just because he's, like, a real one. Well, you and I talked about this off mic... You know, where I, I said Kevin Smith is like the stoner comedy equivalent to Zack Snyder a little bit, where he puts so much love into his movies now, where he has such like a distinct, you know, um, thing that he wants to do to service his fans. Yeah, like Zack Snyder, his fans ride or die. Yeah. Right? Like you and I, I think it's fair to say we're not the biggest Zack Snyder fans. No. Not but, at all. but his fans fucking love him. I mean, Snyder Cut is, like, the biggest example of that, right? Kevin Smith, same thing. And, like, Kevin Smith knows who he's making movies for. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird to just look at this one as, like, its own pure standalone movie. Yeah, this is the movie I feel like you you can show anyone. And because it's his first, you can show anyone and they can all just be like, hell yeah, Clerks is great. I was kind of just surprised in 2023 how well it held up. Yeah, well, especially, like... Obviously, you know, this, the movie was made on, like, a $20,000 budget, and... Well, yeah, this is, like, one of the iconic independent filmmaking stories. Exactly. One of the pinnacle 90s independent filmmaking that stories. That run of, like, Linklater, Soderbergh, uh, Rodriguez, you know? I mean, Kevin Smith was, like, maxing out credit cards to get this movie made. Again, it's... <laughs> I'm not going to go on this rant, because I'm not going to go on my millennial movie rant. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Independent cinema, like, doesn't... It doesn't happen in this way anymore. Nowadays, independent movies, they kind of get thrown on streamers and people forget about them, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And I, well, on one side, you've said that it's good that these movies are still getting to get made and put out, but sometimes it's unfortunate because the way streamers just delete shit from their platform... Yeah. So these movies never get seen. They're not presented in a way of just like, this. you should watch this. Yeah. It's always just dumped on the platform. You kind of have to look for it. And something that was cool in this era of independent cinema, like Reservoir Dog, all this sh stuff, was like, they were put out in theaters. Yeah. And people went to go watch them. So, like, there was a chance for these filmmakers to really have their moment. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, um, I think that's what, like, when I first watched Clerks when I was in high school, it was one of those... Very, very young Chris liked that stuff. Like, like as soon as I saw the black screen text, like for some reason I loved that shit 
of like, well, like having the credits have like a little black screen text, a clip of the montage of him opening, then cutting back to the credits while like grunge music is playing. Because you felt like you could make that. Totally. And I think as well, the 90s always held a special place in my heart. Like I always loved 90s stuff. Like, like my favorite yeah. genre of music is grunge. And a lot of my favorite movies are made in the 90s, too. I just, I just like that. You're era. a proper millennial. Yeah, yeah <laughs> very much. Totally. It's, it sounds corny, but I, I like that stuff. And so, um, yeah, high school Chris, though, who was trying to make short films and stuff, was like, oh, fuck yeah, you can make movies, you know? No. It's perfect. It's super inspirational. Yeah, younger kids who are interested in filmmaking or movies in that way, um, Clerks is like a perfect movie for that. Because it kind of shows you that movies can be this, too. Um and speaking on that, Kevin Smith talked about this, like, when he was promoting Clerks 3, he was on a podcast, and he was saying how, like, the movie that was f that way for him was uh, Linklater's Sl Slacker. Yeah, yeah, I saw him talk about that. And Slacker was the movie, like, when he saw that, he was like, movies can be this? Like, it can, you can make a movie like this? Like, well, if movies can be this, then I know what I want to do. And so that's where the whole, like, well, I have this convenience store, I work here. And for people who don't know, he worked at the store that they shot at. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all came from. Fucking crazy that he did that, too. Because he was filming at night. Yeah. He was like, well, it was closed. That's why they had to close the shutters. And that's why he created the story around the shutters being closed, so they can just have it be dark outside. It's true independent filmmaking of, like, turning the limitations into its own story and making it part of the story. My boy was getting, like, an hour of sleep a day. Yeah, didn't you tell me, you told me once that, like, towards the end of shooting, he was, like, barely awake. Oh, he was, like, falling, yeah, yeah. And the fact that you can watch this movie, and it's coherent, and it actually, like, feels, like, emotionally resonant still, oh, despite yeah. it being so limited in its budget and uh, all that kind of stuff, is so impressive. It's so full of life. So full of life. There's so many ideas, like... The story is so sprawling. Like, I completely forgot that there's this funeral scene. <laughs> yeah, the wake. Like, the fact that they <laughs> get out, I completely forgot they leave Quick Stop Groceries and go to a wake and Randall knocks over a, co a coffin. Yeah, and even on the way there, they have an iconic conversation where he talks about his cousin who died breaking his neck trying to... Suck his own dick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> then he gets Dante to admit well, that Randall he tried says, it. Well, Randall says, come on, man, you're not going to admit it. Like, yeah. always, God, I fuck you, man. And then, and uh, Dante's like, I can never reach. He's like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, your dick? He's like, yeah, you know, everyone's tried it, right? And he's like, no, I never did. <laughs> you pervert. <laughs> the way the camera's in the back seat whipping back and forth. Yeah, it looks so, like, simple and it's so endearing. Well, yeah, there is a lot of style in the movie, but the style comes from the limitations of what they had, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, like, simple things like the editing of the movie really stood out to me. Uh, a lot of the shots are on these wides with conversations of Randall reading a newspaper, Dante in the front, foreground, background stuff, but it's all in a wide. And in order to keep the momentum and the pacing of the scene, like, going, they'll cut to a cat perking up at a certain, like, scene. Yeah, yeah, there's always these little cuts. Or it'll cut back to Jay stealing, stealing shit snacks. in the back or eating stuff. Yeah. Or outside when they're dealing drugs or whatever. Oh, Jay and Silent Bob, which we'll get to Jay and Silent Bob in depth, but, like, there's such a fun recurring element. Well, isn't there so... What's surprising is that there's so much to talk about with this movie. There is, yeah. There's a lot. We haven't even touched on Veronica. We haven't really gotten into Caitlyn, we, you know. <laughs> like you said, we haven't really dived into Jay and Silent Bob. And it's... When you think of this movie, at least when I do, because I haven't seen it that often, I think of uh, Dante and Randall at the front desk. Yeah. That iconic shot of, like, Randall with his hand on his cheek. Yeah. Leaning, yeah. But that's what I think of. And I kind of forget, like, oh, yeah, the hockey on the roof. Um, oh, yeah, they play hockey on the roof. There's all the, yeah, there's all these random little sequences. Or, like, the ch ch uh, Chulis, is that the... Yeah, Chulis, the gum. The gum representative, him holding court inside a convenience <laughs> store and all of them throwing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which, I said this kind of earlier, but that scene is so genius at getting you to feel for Dante. Well, Dante, because they're all, like, chucking it. Yeah, but it's such a good job at demonstrating of, like, how fucking soul-sucking that, that job is. So, you know, before we get into stuff, I want to complete my point that I had about, like, these non-sequiturs actually yes. meaning something. So going back to the Star Wars independent contractor thing, um, I wrote that, like, the customer who is a contractor comes in and starts joining into this conversation is like, are you talking about Star Wars, whatever? And he talked about, he's like, I'm actually 
like I'm running a roofing company and I'm an independent contractor and I yeah. didn't take a job because it was run by this gangster. He's like, and you know, babyface Bambino. <laughs> yeah, babyface Bambino. <laughs> babyface Bambino. <laughs> Randall has such an iconic voice. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, and he was like, so I've turned jobs down based on politics, right? And disapproving mm -hmm. Randall's theory. And this might be a reach, but I like looking at it now, I'm just like, oh, this scene could be interpreted as like a, we all have a choice. Like we all make mm. our bed, sleep in it, right? So we all have a choice in what we do. And I feel like that's the point this movie's trying to make is that like it's, the universe isn't against you. There's stuff that happens you can't control, but you very much play a role in everything. Exactly. Kind of yeah. And obviously maybe I'm reaching and it could also be looked at as this fun non sequitur that's interrupted. But, but if that's how you interpret it, that's how you interpret it. I mean, you probably wouldn't be totally far off. I don't doubt that at all. I mean, like, people have also said how they joke about this in Clerks 3 um, that of the even the black and white aesthetic yeah. adds to the themes. And really, it's for budgetary reasons, but there's a bit in Clerks 3. This is, I don't think this is really too much of a spoiler. Which, I want to be clear to the audience, I haven't seen 2 or 3. Yeah. I've only seen this one, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's just a small, because they basically have Silent Bobby, the cinematographer for the movie they're making. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just Kevin Smith, right? Yeah. But he does talk in that scene, like Silent Bob once in a while talks. But he has says, this great monologue every time, every movie. Yeah. yeah, but he basically explains to them why it should be black and white, but he explains for artistic purposes, where he's like, well, the black and white will emphasize the soulless nature of the job they work, and even the black and white will almost feel like it's a CC TV camera watching them, you know, kind of thing inside a convenience store, and they're like, wow. Like, but really, it's like, when they really made it, it's probably like just because budgetary reasons. Yeah, but that's always my favorite part about any, like, uh, like, great movie or TV show or stuff that you remember is that a lot of people put their own interpretations onto it, um, and I think that's awesome, though. Yeah. But but it is always funny when you read behind the scenes. It's like, oh, it's because we couldn't shoot that way because of the sun. Like, yeah, yeah, I know like, everyone <laughs> looks into it as a deep thing. But I but I love. But that's that's art, though, right? Yeah, yeah, one hundred. Everyone can look at a painting and see something different. That's yeah, the whole point. And regardless of the <laughs> intention, I mean, obviously it's subjective. If people, you know, want to get something out of it, even if it's not the intention, or if they just want to listen purely to the artist's intentions. But if someone gets something out of a piece of art that isn't what the artist was trying to do, yeah. that's totally chill. A hundred percent. I always like respect. I mean, Kevin Smith is the opposite of a guy who lets the art speak for itself. I will say. <laughs> yeah. But and I was gonna say that I love artists who let the art speak for itself because if you leave it open enough, the audience could, you know, have their own relationship with it. It's yeah. like what I was saying. Like, Clerks is a movie that becomes different and takes a different shape as you get older. Yeah. I and I really respect it for that. Um, you want to talk about the eggs real quick? <laughs> yeah. Well, can I say something real quick? That actor about him? The actor, the egg guy. Yeah. The egg guy. Okay, I'll name him real quick because I wrote it. Oh, okay, down. I wrote it down too. Yeah. Walt Flanagan. Okay. Do you know that he played like four different characters in the movie? What? Yeah. Is he like Peter Sellers yeah. in this movie? <laughs> I think they made that joke. Yeah. He um, and it's really just because again the movie was so cheap that Kevin Smith just had friends and family act in it. No, like most of them weren't really actors. What? No. What other characters did he play? He played as the offended customer later on. Whoa. Who was like who yelled at them, and then he was also wait not the angry hockey customer, right? No, 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 no. The guy who when um when Randall's explaining the nudie booths. Remember how yeah. he's like saying like, you have highly offended me. That's the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> and then he was also in, um, like he appeared with a hoodie on to, um, when he's like, cute cat, what's his name? Annoying customer, fucking dick. Right. You don't see his face in that, but apparently that was him. And he also was in the beginning when he buys a pack of cigarettes. So he's like one of the dudes buying cigarettes. Yeah. On. Again, but... <laughs> a pure miracle that this movie was held together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, go ahead with the egg scene. That's awesome. Though. Yeah. That made me so happy. <laughs> I, I know, dude. Know it's like crazy. I know. It's funny because I, I never put two and two together, and it's funny that some people don't because it's literally he just shows his face as the but, egg guy. But that's what I'm saying. It's the fact. Yeah, you get a nice close up on <laughs> yeah. him. Again, the movie's so low budget, they doing stuff like that, and the fact that it still works and it's coherent is a miracle. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Egg guy. It's one of like it's it feels like a children's short story. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There was there was once an Eggman who had to search for the perfect egg. They asked him, why couldn't you mix and match? He said people don't have standards these days. <laughs> but doesn't it feel like a joke? Because there's a lesson at the end, because yeah. um he said Dante tells him to mix and match. The guy says it's poor to have standards. No one has any pride anymore. Yeah, no one has any pride. What does that mean? 
I, because I love that you don't get to hear him talk, the egg guy. Yeah. But like the, when you when Dante says that, you're just imagining that guy's like, no one has any pride anymore. <laughs> like, you imagine him be weaselly. You can hear that voice. Yeah. Randall after uh, Randall says, uh, it's not like you laid the eggs yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the girl says, uh, like it's like, oh yeah, I've heard this happen once. He was a guidance counselor. It's always guidance counselors. Why always guidance counselors? And she says, well. If your job was as meaningless as theirs, wouldn't you go crazy too? <laughs> it's important to have a job that makes a difference, boys. That's why I manually masturbate caged animals for artificial insemination. Yeah, and she, she does like, this like tears with the yeah, the little sticks. She holding. does this like wise ass like, see, I told you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> like, oh, I know. Dante and Randall just look at each other like, oh, right. yeah, their minds were blown for a second. <laughs> but obviously, I mean, the metaphor is very clear. Yeah. Right. Of I mean, you and I, I mean, we've had those times at work yes. where you're like, okay, so what the hell am I like breaking my mind about? Like, why am I so stressed out about something that doesn't matter? What am I doing with my life? I want to do other things, but half my like effort and my mental and physical energy is going towards something that doesn't matter. Yeah, but I have to do this thing in order to survive and pay my bills and eat. In LA, that's a real feel. When you go to any, if you go to any restaurant in LA, everyone wants to be something else. Oh yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And everyone's going through that same struggle. It's very real. Yeah, and um, what was it though? But uh, really quickly though, that's what I mean by it being like a children's short story. It's like there's a nice lesson at the end with this quirky <laughs> metaphor. It yeah. just it really made me happy. I was like, this could be a short film. This and is good. <laughs> it's just so specific too. Like you know, Kevin Smith dealt with someone like that when he worked at a convenience store. Yeah. Like you and I have dealt with strange customers. Not even like just asshole customers, but just weirdly specific things. Like I remember at Coldstone, I had this lady that said she was a texture person and wanted me to <laughs> scoop. I know, right? Right off the bat, that's weird when you're ordering ice cream. Which, but she said, "Can you give me a chocolate ice cream, but scoop it from this area?" And I was like. Oh, okay, and I go for it, and she's like, "No, not th not there. No, no, right. Over I don't see how this is complicated. Right there. What the fuck? I'm gonna mix it up. What are you talking about? It's like what Randall says. This job would be great if it wasn't for the fucking customers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's so true, dude. <laughs> we said we'd talk about this. Let's just go for it. Jay and Silent Bob, probably the most iconic characters, and, and you know that they're the R2 and C3PO of the Viewisk universe. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred. They're literally sprinkled in all of them. <laughs> And it's kind of that Kevin Smith, I'm a comic book nerd, I know, like, this is the type of storytelling I'm familiar with. Yeah. Which is, like, certain characters that are kind of, like, otherworldly, they're gonna show up in everything. And you can tell when he was writing Clerks, and maybe he didn't plan it, maybe I'm reading into it, mm -hmm. but, like, you can tell these characters feel like comic book characters. Yeah, well, yeah, they have such distinct looks. You the know? fact <laughs> that it's Jay and Silent Bob feels like a duo. Um, and it's like that only Kevin Smith, who is a true nerd, could write stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just impressive, like, for your first movie, again, that's so cheap and that's so low concept to create, like, characters like that. Yeah. Oh, I know, dude. They're, they're, again, like you said, they're so simple and doable, but they're so memorable and funny. What's your favorite, like, vignette of Jay and Silent Bob? Probably their dance scene. Oh, I mean, their so dance good. scene is amazing. <laughs> I also love the tiny bit when... Right after he has a heated exchange with the customer and the lady storms out, Randall goes right out and is like, hey, you're not allowed to rent here anymore. And Jay's like, yeah! <laughs> like, we all have met shitheads like that who've like just <laughs> capitalized off of your anger. That was also very real. Like, again, working at my dad's deli slash grocery store, it was in like a weird part of town. We all got different type of characters. Jay is the type of character that you would totally see outside yeah, the store. exactly. I think what I love about them as well is like, in distinctly in the first movie, Silent Bob is very cool and collected while he's yeah. smoking cigarettes. He's very serious and he just looks like a badass. He's a lot funnier in later movies. He's more expressive and more like well, especially once like he they get the Jane and Silent Bob strike back exactly you know? and all that. But in the first one, Silent Bob is like pretty calm and I'm like, so interested. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and putting himself in it, put it like Kevin Smith putting himself in the movie. Yeah. As if he already didn't have so much to do with such a low budget is still pretty impressive at that point. I mean, now it's at a point where Kevin Smith puts himself in everything. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm just clowning on the guy because he is one of the most self-indulgent people out oh, yeah, there. Oh yeah, and we all love him for it in a way, you <laughs> The know? guy will be like, now you will watch me on stage just talk for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because Kevin Smith wasn't even supposed to play Silent Bob originally. He wasn't even supposed to be there that day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> he was actually going to put himself as Randall, funny enough. Okay, yeah, that so makes sense for yeah, him. Yeah, he was like, oh, that's I right. want to be the cool, wise-ass guy. He, he <laughs> jokes about that. He's like, that's why he has the funny lines and stuff. But um, And then he, I think he just realized that he can't mentally keep up with that type of role and want to do something a little more yeah. low-key. And then he did Silent Bob, and now it's like his signature character. A hundred percent. And yeah, you want to buy Funko Pops of Chicken Silent Bob. Yeah, totally. And um, The dancing is really cool, too, because it's so like... It's immediately iconic. And yeah. I'm not saying that as a hyperbole. It's just there's something about the way where it's just like dimly lit yeah. spotlight on them. He brings out the they bring out the speaker, sit down, <laughs> and at first it's just Jay going hard. Yeah. And then cuts to the store, cuts back, and Silent Bob's like, <gasps> like yeah. Silent Bob. Oh, and Jay's like trying to get him to. He like kinda nudges him. He's like, come on, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, part of you is like, oh, these are friends forever. Yeah. Yeah. I think this movie's so much about like friendship. No shit. I know I'm, I'm yeah. not being like, that's but, not subtle, but there is like something about that of Jay and Sai Bob and Dante and Randall where you're like, oh, these guys are forever. Well, yeah, and it <laughs> highlights that kind of like, you know, that lower class boredom, you know, yes. when, when you're just kind of trying to get by together and you're just standing out in the open, just Dude, chilling. Dude, that's such a good way to put it. Like, and we've all <laughs> had those moments at like, Working at a store even. Yeah. You know what I mean? And those downtimes that you have where you're making just dumb jokes and you're bonding over dumb bits and everything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, lower class boredom <laughs> is a great way to put that. Because you're just like, let's just fucking dance. Yeah, like, you exactly. Know what I mean? And I also just love Jay's little nudges where he's like, Sal Bob, you're rude as hell, but you're still cute though. And he like starts humping him on the side. Like such <laughs> weird interactions. But it feels like something real like shithead friends would do. Yeah, I know. It's like, and uh, Silent Bob's like, they, they just keep each other around because they kind of just need each other. Yeah. Like, well, Silent Bob doesn't talk that much, and Jay's like the face of the operation. Exactly, yeah. And Jay needs Silent Bob to, like, just mellow out. Like, yeah, chill out, dude. Exactly. Like, if Jay didn't have Silent Bob, Jay would be, like, on the streets. He'd like... be getting beat up all the time, you know, because he'd be annoying everyone. But I also love the line he says towards the end, too, which is, I don't know if you knew this just fun trivia that this line was actually a fuck up, but when Jay says to Dante and he's like, you know, my, my grandma used to say, what's better, a good plate with, no way to, I fucked up. What's a good plate with nothing on it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that line was an actual flub that he did. But it works so well. Yeah, I guess he was, I think he was either really high or really drunk when they shot that scene. <laughs> and so he was supposed to say something wiser, but then he did that whole walk off. Remember how he curses him out as he leaves? Yeah. And then I guess Kevin Smith just took it upon himself to say, like, to just say that last line. But it, I guess it wasn't supposed to play out that way originally. <laughs> Jason Mewes, man. Jason Mewes, yeah. I think, is so good. And He's... we'll get more into it. I think we're going to start talking about Dante in a little deeper way. Yes. And Randall and all this stuff. But all these performances don't, it doesn't feel like there's actors on screen. Yeah, in the best way. Yeah. Like, Dante is a real dude. Like, oh, I, he's so good, dude. Him and especially him and Randall's like banter, the how smooth their dialogue is. Let's shout out their names. Dante yeah. Hicks played by Brian O'Halloran, Randall Graves played by Jeff Anderson. Yeah. Uh they feel like dudes that be at a store that's next to my apartment. Like I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Especially again, I got to stress with a low budget movie with very little time they probably had to rehearse. The fact that they're nailing pages of dialogue yeah all in one take for like <laughs> but it feels like it's just coming out of their ass like yeah, i don't yeah. get it like uh, again a miracle that this movie happened because for low budget movies people don't have dialogue like this yeah. where it's so long and extensive and kind of complicated but dante and randall deliver it like they're just those guys at that store i just believe them so hard i was so impressed yeah you know <laughs> Dante's in a bit of a love triangle. That's really kind of the ongoing A story. If you had to pick what the A story was, yeah, it was it's Dante like pining for his high school ex girlfriend who cheated on him multiple times, eight and a half times, eight and a half times. Caitlin Bree, yes. is his high school ex, played by I like to shout them out and everything because yeah. I wrote them down to cast and crew. Uh, Lisa Spoonauer, 
Yes. Is, uh, she passed away. Yeah, in like 2017, right? Yeah, I think Clerks 3 was dedicated to her or something mm -hmm. like that, but yeah. Yeah, and she's amazing as Caitlyn. But going to the beginning, though, with um, Veronica. Veronica's probably like the best on-screen girlfriend someone like Dante could ask for. Played by Marilyn <laughs> Gigliotti. I was pissed off at Dante the entire time. <laughs> she brings a tray of lasagna to him in the middle of his work shift. Yeah. And it's just like, I brought you lunch, and it's a tray of lasagna? Are you kidding? That's what I want. Like, are you kidding <laughs> yeah. me? It's like, yeah. And he's just like, fucking Caitlyn, she's I know. engaged. And I'm like, let it go. I but know, it's dude. such a great, like, setup for, like, oh, who this character is. He he doesn't really know how good he has it. Yeah, yeah. and He can't accept his situation. Yeah, and what's interesting, though, is, like, a lot of this movie is about that need to, like, not need, but about that fear of taking control, you know, because there are things you can appreciate in your life that you want to hold on to, then there are things that you don't want and you want to change. But Dante has no idea how to grasp any of that, that concept. Well, he just feels like there's these swings that are coming towards him and he just needs to, like, he doesn't know which one to grab. And it's like, he feels like things are happening to him and he has no choice in the matter. Yeah, he phrases it really well. He says, I'm not the type of person who will disrupt things just so I can shit comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, because wasn't the whole story that he like shit his pants? Because... When he was a when he was a toddler, yeah, because his potty lid was closed and instead of opening the lid to use it, he just crapped his pants as a kid. <laughs> One of the saddest stories I've ever heard. <laughs> but it summarizes him yeah. really well. But, um, uh, for, yeah. Uh, and then obviously the iconic like you suck 37 dicks or whatever yeah yeah i mean <laughs> my favorite punchline is always going to be when he says it to the next customer he's like can you believe it my girlfriend sucked 37 dicks and he's like in a row <laughs> and then it cuts out yeah. <laughs> every scene kind of has like that kind of punchline to it which is great yeah right before it cuts it leaves you with a laugh or some like a shocking moment it's such a funny line though just like 37 dicks like yeah. also something... he gets so heated so fast well i gotta say this is when it's established that dante is such a whiner it, the actor's delivery is so good because yeah. every line he's like what like what are you oh yeah his voice gets very high pitched like i was supposed to be here an hour ago he has that type of delivery <laughs> when he talks sad sap yeah but with that being said um that scene in, in general is probably one of the more, most iconic scenes in Clerks, the 37 dicks. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I think, like... On YouTube, it probably has the most views. Yeah. Exactly. And it's interesting because it taps into such, like, a visceral thing when you're young, when you're with someone. Like, I think there's a really basic principle in relationships. The less you know about their past, the better. It's okay to be ignorant on that. Because it's like, yeah, they had sex before they met you. Yeah, exactly. And, um... I think the movie Chasing Amy has that theme as the entire thing. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, you yeah. haven't seen Chasing Amy. I know the premise of it. But yeah. for people who don't know, maybe you should. Yeah, Chasing Amy is about um, Ben Affleck's character falling in love with a lesbian. <laughs> and he finds out things about her but the, and has a whole complex about it. That's like It's a rom-com, essentially, yeah. with a Kevin Smith you know, kick to it. But it plays into the same types of themes of like... Why does any of this matter when it's like that's not even what they're looking for? Like, if that, why does their past define who they are now? Yeah. And it's a hard thing to grasp because if you find something out like crazy about the person you're with, it is a, you're going to have a reaction, but it's also, it, it, he, she didn't do anything wrong. Well, it also highlights like major insecurities within himself, obviously. Like, he doesn't, you know, like Dante wouldn't give a shit about this if he didn't like respect himself totally right yeah. like but he so feels like his life is going shitty that any situation that mildly it makes him uncomfortable he's like here's another thing life is throwing at me he's so comfortable being the victim at all times very much so and randall's a guy's like i mean yeah we only had one ball but at least we played hockey <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> randall is is very hedonistic and what does that mean it's like where you live life without really caring for the consequences mm. about it, where it's like you just sort of do things and don't think it through. Yeah, it's a very extreme side of the spectrum, but yeah. there is something admirable about it. Totally. Well, like think of like um, like Broad City, 
Lana? Yeah. yeah. Lana, yeah. Like, yeah, her yeah. character is considered very hedonistic. You know, that sort of thing. Or, and like, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Is considered... Yeah, if you were, like, <laughs> in, in broad city terms, Abby is Dante. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're literally the female Dante and Randall, you know? Yeah. It's great. Which, I'm sure Abby and Lana would fucking hate that. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> those characters would hate being compared to the clerk's characters. Yeah, but they kind of, they have the similar, they're kind of screwball comedy characters. Oh, no, for sure. Know? It's just, like, it's, yeah, yeah, it's just funny. But, yeah, so, like, um, going back to Veronica and Dante, though, they've established very early on in that really awesome scene, like, right when uh, they hide, they're, like, cuddling under the desk. Veronica's at this place where, you know, she's going to college, mm -hmm. and she, like, she knows what she's doing with her life, but she's sticking with Dante because he, she can see that Dante's stuck and just wants to be like, listen, you can make some moves. You can go back to school. You can do certain things. And she's been like kind of waiting around for him until that obviously final explosion where she figures out that Dante's been like calling Caitlyn. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Very impressed that like the movie makes him kind of a pretty hateable character oh yeah yeah well dante seems at first a very likable relatable dude and he is a fairly likable dude at, at first glance but i think once you kind of peel back the surface a little bit you kind of realize he's he's, he's a pretty big asshole <laughs> but an asshole in the way of just like we've all kind of been in that stage where we've been assholes without knowing that we were being assholes because we were playing the victim card so hard on our own lives. Exactly, yeah. You know, because I and I, I've been in that position where I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm entitled to certain stuff or I'm like life owes me something. I mean, I think this channel was something that I was reckoning with a lot, right? It was just like. What do you mean? Like, just to expand, like, you mean, like, the success of this channel? Like, getting a following? Well, uh, us switching over to doing reaction videos. Okay. So, I remember the moment where you were like, hey, man, maybe we should stop doing movie reviews, because that's what we were doing before. Maybe we should stop doing short films, movie reviews. Our movie reactions, whenever we do them, do really well. Yeah, and people like them. And it's, like, the first thing that we've really done that people actually come back for. Because in the past, we did a lot of short films and stuff like that, which is the stuff that, like, I felt like I moved out here to L.A. to be a filmmaker. I need to be doing this. And then yeah. we did the movie reviews. I'm like, okay, that's fine as long as we keep making short films on the side. None of it is working. In reactions, people actually enjoyed them. And they were doing well. And, they sh and you know. Our and personalities it, came out the best. And in my heart, I knew I liked them, but I didn't want to accept it. And so I was very reluctant because I felt like... How could this be happening? What would my 21-year-old self say if he saw that I was doing movie reactions? I'm reacting to movies? I'm yeah. not making my own stuff. I'm not being creative, you know? And, you know, we fought about that, to be transparent about it. Yeah, but then yeah we did. I, I came to a realization. I was just like, okay, maybe you got a point. Let's try this out. And I couldn't be happier with where my life is. But it kind of... We all go through that stage a little bit, you know? Yeah, and really what it came down to is like we could still make creatively fulfilling projects and could still do things. Like, if we want to make stuff, we can still make stuff. And I think, if anything, it's But like, it's up to us. It's up to us, and it's less pressure that and stress that comes with it because it's not like, this is what we're doing for a living. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I think what's great now is that exactly what you said, is that if we, you and I sat down and wanted to write something and make something together, we could do it purely for fun. Yeah. And also, now that we have an audience that would be interested in something like that, Possibly, yeah, that would be cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of awesome. But we wouldn't have had that if we didn't do this, you know? And yeah. I couldn't be more happier. But, like, it's, you know, you kind of, everyone needs a Randall in their life to kind of pull them out yeah. of a little bit. You yeah, know? I mean, if you want to transition to Dante and Randall's relationship. That was my way of doing it. Yeah, that was smooth. But... Getting better at this podcasting thing every yeah. day. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude. But that's, I know, isn't that the funny thing? Because uh, we already said it. Randall is not perfect. No. He's impulsive. He's kind of a dick to customers unnecessarily. He, but he also is so comfortable and content with where he is and doesn't want anything more than what he has. The moments that stood out to me is just like, Randall's just happy to hang out with Dante. Yeah. And he's like, well, I just came here to talk to you. And like, <laughs> uh, or just like, like I said, it was just like, at least we got to play. Yeah. You know, and there's so many moments throughout this movie of just like us. We all remember uh, Randall talking shit to customers, right? Uh, just like, I don't like your ruse, ma'am, or so, <laughs> stuff like Your cunning attempt to trick me. Yeah, we all remember <laughs> those moments, but I think this time around I was watching it and it really stuck out to me, like how happy Randall is just hanging out with his buddy. 
or just like realizing that like okay we got to play hockey that's kind of fucking cool yeah and cool we got to do it it didn't work out the way we want to do it but we got to do it and he's accepted i mean especially it's highlighted in the monologue that he gives to dante but he's accepted in the situation he's in he's very aware yeah and he is like he's made his own bed you know what i mean and he lays in it comfortably yeah um it's a position we all want to be in you know but you know we're humans and raw emotions get in the way but it is something that it like really stood out to me i've always been a proponent of there's nothing wrong with having a simple life and yeah. it's funny it's ironic coming from us because we moved to la and like we have a we run a podcast. reaction channel then also a podcast yeah and we then... put our, we express ourselves and put our opinions out there but also at the same time though like you know i i don't want to make a show out of my life and make my life the content you know i want us to talk about movies and have that be the show but my life is separate from that yeah and sure yeah. i'm okay with just yeah like i said well again I, I you know i'm not gonna go as far to say you're my randall I, but i mean kind of because you kind of made me help me realize that we've been each other's randall 100%. you know what i mean that's really what it comes down to. but i will say that you are a person that kind of inspired me to have that outlook on life a little bit okay. i'm just like well like what am i looking for when it's when i'm saying like i need to be looking for something bigger mm -hmm. like i'm happy where i am right now right and yeah, my future goals is to be financially stable like everyone. But if I reach that, why do I want more? Yeah. You yeah. know, and um, that's kind of the Randall mentality of just like, are you happy where you're at? Yeah, it's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, we have best friends right now. You know, we love each other. I have a girlfriend I'm crazy about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, okay, am I where exactly I'm at? No. Can I get there? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. down the road, maybe, hopefully. But are you happy right now? And that's what's important. And also, like, yeah, you know, R Randall's definitely knows what kind of job he has. Mm -hmm. Like, this shit's not important. Yeah. Like, he knows that. And it's like a mentality I wish sometimes I had when I was working the shitty customer service job and I put so much stress onto myself for that. Like, yeah. Randall has completely let himself go to a point that is extreme and we shouldn't follow it but yeah. <laughs> i will say there is a part of me that like always thinks back to like when customers used to talk back at me and be very rude to me mm -hmm. and i was like oh i could have said something back yeah i could have yeah. easily said something back and i never did because because i thought oh man that's so disrespectful i'm like no they were disrespectful to me and i'm doing them a service <laughs> yeah yeah i mean obviously like you did the best you could and i've done the best i could too but i always think back at those moments you yeah know? and like you know it's seeing randall do that which is randall gives off that cheesy thing that everyone say where he's like he's my spirit animal but he is that kind of character oh yeah 100 percent. i mean i think the line that it's such a simple line but a line that hit me is when he goes on his rant at the end when he says anybody could waltz in here and do our jobs yeah, you know I mean? yeah, yeah. It's so true. Like, you really, you take a step back because we all have been so stressed in our workplace where we're like, man, you know, like I have to be here for an extended amount of time when I didn't want to, but they asked me to, this and that. And you, yeah. you take a step back and you're like, oh, this job is really easy. This is, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why am I acting like it's so important? But it's so true when you, like you said, it becomes your whole world and you put all your mental energy into it that you, it's like, yeah, you give a shit about it because that's all there is. I, I also think it's very. <laughs> I'm, it's still really funny that Randall just tells everything to Veronica. Oh, yeah, yeah. He thinks he's doing Dante a favor. Because from his perspective, he's like, well, Dante was going to do it. Yeah. So I might as well just do it for him. And in the long run, it was a good call. But it's just like, dude, what the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> I know. But at the same time, But though, maybe like, that pushed Dante towards a better direction. Right? Yeah, I mean, he kind of, in a weird way, though, he has more respect for women than Dante does. When he goes off on Dante, when he's like... You're pining after your ex-girlfriend without even discussing how you felt with your present. You know, he seems to have a better idea of what the right moves are in a relationship. Well, I think it's just like Randall doesn't have that entitlement the way Dan, uh, Dante does. Yeah. Um, and Dante has that classic thing of like wanting something he can't have. He's a dog chasing cars, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like what Joker said. Can we stop invoking Joker? <laughs> all, of, all of this is going to tie into Heath Ledger's Joker. Oh, <laughs> but, but no, it's it's very true, yeah. And um, I I always like that Randall still had Dante's back. He says to Caitlin, like, "Oh, if you break his heart again, I'll kill you." Like he's still gonna. Yeah, that's great. He's gonna be there for his friend, but he even though he knows he's wrong. Which is like a good friend thing to do. You know, you know your friends are wrong, but you're like, you know what? I'm still going to protect him. <laughs> Something that's great about Randall is that he's a type of character in a sitcom or a movie where, you know how sitcom and movie best, or specifically sitcom best friends are always assholes? 
Mm -hmm. Where you're like, why are they best friends? Yeah. And uh, what I liked about Randall is that, yeah, he's kind of, uh, like, says what he thinks and, like, doesn't hold back and is kind of a dick or whatever. But he there he really cares for Dante. And yeah. you can see it. And so I like that. I like that there is, like, a protection that he has for Dante and he cares for him. And the movie shows that. And so there's that question of just, like, is he friends with him or is he just li likes to bully him? Yeah, Because yeah. you could verge on that line of bullying very quickly. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's very hard to dance around that. But it does add an extra dimension to Randall's character, for sure, that he's very protective of him. It's a believable best friend that you would have, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is kind of random, but do you want to talk about that scene? We talked about it on the phone for a little bit leading up to this, but that one dude who says to Dante that he's out of shape. Okay. Do you want to go over that one? So, I think... <laughs> You know, maybe we could like tie it in together because it's a it's a, a lot about Dante's self respect that he like yeah you know what I mean or like his self esteem. Possibly the one of the funniest performances I've seen <laughs> like in a while. But okay, I wrote down uh, tra trainer is what he's credited as, and his name is Ernest O'Donnell, um, which of course he's in an O'Donnell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But goddamn, like every, like his face, like it has a permanent shit eating grin on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, he has this toothy grin. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, looks like you gained a little weight there. Or yeah, he's like, yeah, you're out of shape. I heard that grunt and he passed me the milk. <laughs> like, how, like, de. De uh, emasculating must it be. I heard that grunt. And yeah, like so like, much. <laughs> he's like alphaing the he's shit. He's wearing out. a sweater and these short shorts that you see when he's walking out, like for a quick second. Yeah. He ends up also picking up the girl that he's chatting with. He's like, "You want to ride home?" Yeah. And uh, he's like, "How much can you bench?" And the girl starts guessing. He's like, 50, 60 tops." <laughs> he's like, "No, I can do more." <laughs> So Again, it's just the whining that Dante yeah. has. It's like, I can do more than that. I can definitely do more than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a... Yeah, it is... You're right. Like, these customers have... It's a great way to, like, beat up Dante in a certain way to really bring him down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, even the small... Well, then they really put the chair on top when he finds out about Caitlin Bree. He's like, oh, isn't she with an Asian design major? Don't take this the wrong way, but I used to fuck her. <laughs> God damn it! Like, like while they were together, <laughs> like, that was a long time ago, man. Don't yeah, like you couldn't think this interaction could have gotten any worse. I know. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ! <laughs> you know what kind of reminded me of a little bit, hmm. and maybe I'm reaching here because I just want to talk about this movie, but it reminded me of the thing that we quote from Spider-Man Two a lot, which is like "Eat the cake, Peter." You know. Mm. Which, it, it's not a quote from the movie, but it's a thing we talk about a lot of just, like, fucking chill out, calm down, or just, like, the weight of the world is not on your shoulders Yeah, or breathe for a second. Just breathe for a second, yeah. you know? And obviously Dante's not, like, Peter Parker or whatever, but it's something you can connect to at that stage of your life where you just feel like you're getting beat up from no end and you have no control over anything. Yeah, when you're drowning and have to kind of overcompensate for it. 100%. Let's now get to this the final denouement. <laughs> the yeah, denouement yeah. Or whatever. All, yeah, all those little uh, title cards between the scenes. That's such like young filmmaker I thing. know. It's so pretentious, but you love it. No, but it's what you said, though. Yeah. It's like when you see that kind of shit when you're a young like teenager, you're like, fuck yeah. Because like, yeah, yeah. it feels like iMovie It's filmmaking. so self-important. But again, I mean that in a loving way. I do not mean that in like a judgmental way. Even Kevin Smith himself talks about how like you need some naivete and self-importance to oh, achieve things because... 1,000... I, like, yeah. believe in that so much. Yeah. yeah. He said in an interview where he was saying, like, yeah, if I thought to myself, nah, everything in movies has been said. I think I'm okay. Maybe maybe I'll get to it. But, you know, Clerks might have never happened, you know? But he, you have to have that sort of going in blind mentality. Circling back to the denim all. <laughs> okay, so, Caitlin Bree shows up. They're yeah. all lovey-dovey. She's like, I ditched my fiancé. Which, you know that... The, that's bullshit. bullshit. She's going to cheat on Dante the exact same way. It's her serial cheater habit. Dante puts on his date sweater. <laughs> yeah, the most 90s sweater you've ever seen. Yeah, <laughs> it's clearly the like. It's clearly like he has one good sweater. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? And he like wears it on a date. Like he has one. Like and we've all been there. We yeah. have like one good outfit. Your go-to outfit for your first date. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mine and, was a tight navy blue sweater. Do you remember that? I've seen it. Yeah. yeah it's been, doesn't fit me anymore, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> still, <laughs> your, your long-term girlfriend—that was your first date yeah, outfit with it her. It works, though. So. Yeah, hell yeah. Anyway, okay. though, so 
He comes in, talks to Randall. She's in the bathroom. Now, it's established a few scenes earlier that there was this guy that wanted to use the bathroom and he starts making crazy demands. He's like, listen, man, there's that weird toilet paper. Can I use your... There's some double ply toilet Oh yeah, paper that right old there. man who's like, hey, sonny boy, what, what kind of toilet paper and do you he keeps, have? he keeps coming back to make more requests <laughs> and he's just like, I'm going to be there for a while. Can I just get a magazine or whatever? Yeah. How about that one? What about that one in the, the back? Porno mags? <laughs> Again, Ryan O'Halloran's delivery. Yeah. The porno mags? <laughs> so now, you as an audience member watching it have forgotten about the guy. Yeah. Because we move on through later in the day. Because there's been several non sequiturs and you think he's just another one. It's a great staging. She uses the rent uh, restroom. Dante in his date sweater is just chatting with Randall. She comes back looking very horny. And yeah, her hair's all messy. She's like, like mind oh blown. My God, you were amazing. I just love that you sat there and let me do all the work. <laughs> Didn't you have to kiss or talk? He's like, what are you talking about? And then you realize it's that fucking guy we forgot about. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well, I remember when you showed me this movie for the first time like four years ago. Yeah. Um, and I reacted the way I reacted. I remember you looked at me the way you look at me sometimes when we do reaction videos, where you know a big moment's about to come up. <laughs> and you're quiet, and I react, and you look at me, you're like, Yeah, she <laughs> fucked a dead guy. <laughs> that actually happened. It's so, like, uncomfortable still to this day, the reveal of her slowly realizing what happened. And, it, and also, it, the fact that, like, while she's, uh, Randall and Dante are talking to the detective lady, while the old man's in the stretcher. Oh, yeah, you see the, the pitching a tent. Yeah, and then you get, like cutaways to her in the ambulance just like <laughs> oh yeah with a blanket on full trauma <laughs> yeah it's wild it's now, also, <laughs> sorry go ahead I was, it's also like the franticness of it like of not knowing how to really approach that type of emergency where he was like call the police and he's like what, for what it's like because someone's in the bathroom and he just r worded Caitlin he's like you said she did all the work <laughs> like there's <laughs> such like <laughs> Like, how would you handle it? Yeah, yeah, it's so like confusing. That? Like, how do you possibly, like, who is that person? No one's been in this situation ever. And also just embarrassed for her because she's like, this isn't funny. What happened? <laughs> so after Kaylin gets driven away, Randall exposes to Veronica that Dante's actually was interested in someone else. And Veronica ends up attacking Dante over it and fully just breaking up with him, goes, like, goes off on him. And she even tells him, like, I want you to end up with Caitlyn just so you know how much of a fucking idiot you are. She has a great winning moment in the totally, movie. Totally, and she leaves. And then Dante attacks Randall. He just straight up tackles him, and there's this, like, he hits him with a piece of bread. And they even cut to, like, an insert shot of the bread nailing him in the head. I kind of like how awkward the fight is. Totally. Because they're just... in this, like, contained space, and it's like, feels like real friends fighting. Yeah, it's like, what are you doing? Like, they don't know how to really, they don't want to hurt each other, yeah, but it's they're still like, angry. Ah, how's your neck? <laughs> yeah, it's like such brother energy. Yeah, yeah. Like, it reminds me of Napoleon Dynamite when uh, they got into, like, the headlock, and he's like, I think you just ripped my mole off. <laughs> it's like, he's like, oh, did I? He's like, yeah, is it bleeding? A little. <laughs> I think my favorite Napoleon Dynamite fight is still in the school hallway when he's just like, oh, when the bullies just. <laughs> slamming him against <laughs> for people who are listening and not watching i had like i was imitating the scene where he, the bully had napoleon in a headlock and just was pushing him up and down awkwardly yeah as enough. like students are just walking <laughs> past not even watching or anything we need to do that movie we'll man. we'll get to napoleon for god sure. damn that's we, one we that's like a four hour want. podcast right like that's <laughs> <laughs> i know we can go in deep that one but so yeah they get into a whole fight and Randall ends up saying after they're checking on each other, he's like, you didn't have to choke me, man. He's like, choke you? Randall, I'm surprised I didn't kill you. And yeah. while he goes, in the, he's like, you get me dumped by this and that. I go through, you know, he basically talks about how shitty his day was. And then he wraps it all up with, and he says, and you know what the real tragedy of all this is? I'm not even supposed to be here today. <laughs> and Randall. Like, yeah, acting like he's in this Shakespearean tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And then, yeah, Randall just picks up some piece of food. He's like, oh, fuck you, pal. Fuck you. Yeah, and then goes on the rant that kind of just, like, speaks to all of us, mm -hmm. right? Like, we've all been in that position, as I've said this entire podcast, and it's a scene that I go back to a lot. It's a good scene to watch to just kind of remind yourself. I rewatch <laughs> that scene a lot, yeah. Yeah, it, um, and it's it's a, just a good movie scene, but also, mm -hmm. like, a... You know, it's weird to say, but kind of inspiring scene. Oh, no, it's super just inspiring. Just, like, get your yeah. head out of your ass a little bit, you know? Exactly, I mean? yeah. 
and we already touched on a lot of the lines. And he says, you hold the weight of the world on your shoulders like this place would just fall apart if Dante wasn't here. You overcompensate for basically having a monkey's job, etc, etc. But I think the line that really hits for me, at least, is also at the tail end when he says, we look down on everyone for coming in and just buying a paper, or God forbid, cigarettes. We look down on them like we're so advanced. Well, if we're so fucking advanced, what are we doing working here? Yeah. And he gets up and storms out. Yeah, and he was going to say it was just like... Jalen Silent Bob, we looked at, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot how he phrased it, but he has no delusions of what he does. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, coming back to that idea of just like, there are people in life that are happy with what they have, or even if they're not happy, they know what they have. It's a really good way to wrap it up, finally. Uh, and obviously, I just love that shot, too, of them cleaning together. Yeah, when they're just picking up their mess. Because again, it's that moment of just like, oh yeah, friends for life. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, like you know, you, we, you and I, We've like, gone into some gnarly fights in our time. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah like really bad fights. And now like, it's gonna. Ha and just to be clear, it's not like a, in a toxic way, but just in a, we're best friends well, running I, a business I, together. Uh, also, <laughs> I also believe that if you're really truly best friends, like come on, you've had fights. Like yeah, the, exactly. But at the end of the day, you and I know at the core of it, it's like oh, we'll get. Th we're still friends. Oh, and we'll get through it. And you and I like it's. We come to an understanding all the time, and we become better friends because of it. Yeah, and on the other side of it, usually we end up lightening up and joking about clowning on our points you know yeah like, exactly even yeah even later later on we'll still use quotes that we've made while we fought against each other just to like fuck with each other a little bit yeah and it's that moment where he's like hey can you do that walk or whatever yeah <laughs> when he's singing berserker to him he's like come on he's like oh no it's like come on and then he starts singing it and then he, <laughs> and he does it and it's like a great it's a great like again like i said friends for life yeah yeah, and then just kind of perfectly. Caps oh God! Off a great saying, final line. You're closed. <laughs> like a great final line. Yeah. It's the, that's like the little like uh, I'm. This is my first movie. Let's like. Well, remember, it wasn't even originally supposed to end that way. Oh, it's supposed to be the. Yeah. That's, that's a first movie move. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> yeah. like a. Oh, shooting my main character to make a point. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But is... the ending is kind of just perfect. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and it's more sentimental than I know Kevin Smith probably intended. It is funny that after this, Kevin Smith becomes very sentimental. Super about stuff. sentimental. Yeah. I mean, Tusk is weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but anyway, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> well, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much to our patrons for supporting us again and again. We really appreciate you all. And last but not least, stay nice, dudes.